Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, this is a blinding light up here, but I can see a lot of people in front of me. Um, so I'm going to try and, and, and do what Harry has just done and stick to time as well. And for those of you who know me will know that that is, will be a remarkable feat if I do. And just to end any rumours, I'm not one of the international experts that Harry just spoke about. Or if I am, I'm one of the really cheap international experts. Um, so I was given the topic this morning to talk about the challenges of, of climate change. Um, and I really appreciate the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. I've been in my role at MPI for the last uh, approximately nine months. And um, I haven't been able to talk about anything that have, I have expertise in uh, in that nine month period. So every week there seems to be something new that I need to learn. So some of the challenges of climate change. You're going to see a graph similar to this, I'm sure, numerous times over the next two days. Um, we've had an unprecedented warming over the last 150 years, and I think you know, this long time frame really points out uh, the, if anyone had any doubts how fast it is happening, um, this, this graph would certainly um, put those doubts to bed. And of course, what's really frightening is the, the graph that if we do nothing, uh, that's the top part of, of this graph, which suggests that we will end up with an average global climate somewhere between four and five degrees warmer than it is currently. And of course, that's not evenly distributed. That tends to um, be far more influential in the northern and southern latitudes, and therefore we have major effects on our, on our climate, obviously, but on our um, oceans and on, in, in our atmosphere. Um, and, and then there's their sequences in terms of uh, commitments, pledges, um, the two degree pathway and the 1.5 degree pathway. And you can see that by 2050, we need to be, or by 2100, we need to be at effectively a carbon neutral for the planet. And by 2050, we need to be a long way along that pathway. Um, 2050 used to seem like such a long way away until very, very recently. So. Um, put things in context, um, again, you'll all be familiar with this, but the Paris Agreement uh, committed us as a country to a 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, below our 2005 mark. Now, we're a long way off of that. Um, in fact, from memory, I don't think we've, I think we're ex exactly the same as we were in 2005. So we have a long way to go in the space of 11 years. Um, one of the things, though, that the, the Paris uh, Agreement did recognize was uh, the importance of food security and really placed that treaty in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, where um, so some of those goals um, obviously um, were related to climate action, but some of the important ones also were zero hunger, zero thirst, if you think about it, with clean water available for everyone no poverty and reduced inequalities. So the Paris Agreement um, and the Sustainable Development Goals are um, well, well aligned. So what are we dealing with here? Well, many of you will have heard the term wicked, a wicked problem. I'm sure you've all heard it at this stage. Apparently, as I, as I Wikipedia'd it, it, it's a term that came out of the 1960s, housing problems. But, but basically, it is a problem without a simple solution. It is a problem, um, um, and as we know with any of these things, there are multiple levers that we can pull. But generally, when we pull one lever, another lever goes the opposite direction to the way we want it. So it's, it's a problem where there isn't a simple solution. And it's defined, as, as mentioned earlier, by uh, an unprecedented uh, increase in our atmospheric carbon dioxide over the last 20 to 30 years in particular. And um, when we, when we look at the source, the global source of that carbon dioxide footprint, it's so heavily embedded in our lifestyle that it becomes a really, really difficult thing to untangle. Because when you look at the uh, country's greenhouse gas footprint relative to GDP, you can see that everyone's greenhouse gas footprint is actually linked to how we live. And most of us have chosen how we live. Most of us that are lucky enough to be able to have chosen how we live, and many of us don't actually want to reverse that to uh, the days of our parents or our grandparents or further back along. For anyone that's interested, New Zealand sits uh, just to the west of the United States there on this particular graph. Um, but that, to me, is actually a false metric because it's all of our production of greenhouse gases divided by our population, which I'll talk about as we go along. Is, is not a true reflection. If you look at our consumption, then we sit very much in the mean of those developed countries. So this wicked problem, I've broken it down into what I believe are, are four different parts, but they're inextricably linked. We've got political challenges, social challenges, we've got ethical questions to ask ourselves, which we'll touch on, 
And of course, we've got scientific challenges, which I'll, I'll talk about as well. But I'm going to start off with the political challenges, because um, this is a quote um, from one of the early IPCC authors, um, Richard Somerville. Uh, and he, I'll, I'll read it out for those that are at the back of the room. But it's a world in which all human beings were equal, rational, and perfectly governed when confronted with the prospect of global warming might reach an optimal decision based on compelling climate science. That ideal world would then find effective international agreements to restrict greenhouse gas emissions and avoid harmful climate change. We do not live in such a world. And when you think about it, it's very, very obvious that we don't because the largest part of the global uh, footprint, um, carbon dioxide footprint, or carbon dioxide equivalent footprint, belongs to four to five countries. Now, this is a dated graph, admittedly, and um, I'm fairly sure India has actually leapfrogged a couple of the others up along this list here uh, since this was made. But I used it because um, I wanted to use the following graph, which is a, a mimic of it. Um, so this is 1990 to 2011. Even, and, and I do, we do hear the arguments a number, um, by many that, well, the developed world has had a fair crack at this, and therefore we can't implement the restrictions that need to be implemented on the developed world on developing countries. But when you look at the 1850 to 2011 graph, those same countries make up the vast bulk of our carbon footprint. It makes perfect sense, obviously, that the major industrial nations of today have, are, are, would have been the major industrial nations of 150 years ago because that's how they became the major industrial nations of today. But no matter what way we look at it, we, we, there's, there's four to five, six countries that make up the vast bulk of that um, carbon footprint, which is a real political problem. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that we don't do our, our international duty and our, our moral responsibility because the greatest threat to our planet is the, is the belief that someone else is going to save it. Um, but we do have to look at our place in the planet as a, political, um, as a political challenge because New Zealand has a greenhouse gas footprint that is 0.17% of the total green greenhouse gas footprint in the world. Um, so we could lead the world in, in carbon zero. We could lead the, the challenge and drive forth with it. We could undermine our own economy. We could reduce our, our own lifestyles. But if the big boys and girls of the world don't follow suit, then our actions will have been for naught. And so this is a real political problem that our politicians have to wrestle with at, at, um, at international fora. The other thing is New Zealand has a very unique greenhouse gas footprint, which you're all aware of, no doubt. Um, on a global level, agriculture is agriculture and land uses um, and forestry are approximately a quarter of the, of the global footprint. Agriculture itself sitting at around 10% of the global footprint, whereas New Zealand is actually sitting at just shy of 50% of our, our gross emissions come from agriculture. So we've got a unique problem there in its own right. The other thing, of course, is from a political point of view, that is associated with, and this is again is a dated figure, last year 42 billion in exports, this year we're estimating it'll be 46 billion in exports of a 70 billion target. So nearly 60% of our net export earnings is coming from that carbon footprint. So uh, again, a, a wicked problem from a political point of view, how do we balance our international responsibilities, our moral responsibilities, and yet uh, govern our country in a very sustainable way? Now, I've, I've still, I don't believe, I think I can say this, I don't believe I've ever come across a country so hell-bent on self-flagellation in my life. I've, I travel the world, and um, I, I see all these countries patting themselves on the back at all the solutions they've come up with, all the step-forwards they've taken when they haven't necessarily made any progress, and yet our press and our general populace uh, like to take a whip to us, uh, to ourselves regularly. And this is just, again, pointing out uh, from a New Zealand newspaper, obviously, that New Zealand is the seventh worst on emissions of 41 nations. But as I said, it's a false metric. In my opinion, it's a false metric. There's no doubt it's true. But when you look at our actual carbon footprint, we come down closer to the, the, the run-of-the-mill developed country. The fact that we feed 10 times our population, and the reason you people are in the room today, is, uh, is, is the reason why our carbon footprint is so high. And ethically, we have to ask ourselves the question, should we reduce that carbon footprint? Should we reduce our food production when we do it so efficiently, when we do it so carbon efficiently, 
and allow other countries to uh, uh, take up the challenge of feeding the world with a far greater carbon footprint? It's a difficult ethical question. Now, when we look at our, our carbon footprint over the last uh, 20 or so years, um, it's increased by approximately 20%. And when we break that down, agriculture has increased by about 12%, energy by, and, 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 in, in, and um, industrial processes by between 30 and 35%. Um, and and that's, that's since 1990. Agriculture since 2005, which is where the Paris Agreement is starting, has actually reduced its carbon footprint by around 3.5%. So, but that, that, and that increase in our carbon footprint has been associated with about 30 billion in export revenue growth. So again, I hope, I, I, I know I'm probably preaching to the converted, but this is the great wicked problem, the wicked challenge that we've got to deal with. The other side of that, of course, is, and this again is a political challenge that we've got to wrestle with, is there is now pretty widespread recognition that the gases that, we, we, that are amassed into the greenhouse gas collective behave differently. They have different heating effects. We've all known that, and they've been, that's been factored into carbon dioxide equivalents for a long time. But there's now the recognition that they have different half-lives. And so methane as a gas relative to carbon dioxide has a very different effect on our long-term climate. Um, again, a, another uh, political challenge for us. And if we were to remove agriculture, as it, as it has been from the ETS, but if methane were, or if methane were to be stabilized or reduce slightly and therefore not to have a long-term impact on our temperature, then our, our greenhouse gas portfolio changes dramatically. And again, we fall into the other part of the world where our lifestyle choices are really what is driving our carbon footprint. We've got social challenges. So you'll all, you'll all have heard of uh, Meatless Mondays at this stage, and it sounds like a modern phenomenon. Meat, meatless Mondays started 100 years ago. It's, they started 102 years ago when the recognition of uh, a lack of food for our soldiers um, uh, in the United States became apparent. And so the general populace were, were requested to have meatless Mondays, wheatless Wednesdays, and I think it was porkless Fridays to try and save food for the armed forces. It was food was going to win the war. Food was going to win World War, 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 war One. But we've seen that um, grow into the recent, um, uh, the recent publication of the Eat Lancet's report on um, food in the Anthropocene and basically uh, a recommendation to reduce the consumption of animal products to near zero, not quite zero, but near enough to zero that I won't be cooking a meatball once a week. If, I'm, if I decide to go down that path, I probably just wouldn't bother with the meatball. So it's, gonna, it's, it's certainly challenging where, we've, where we have been as a species for probably the last 200,000 years and certainly the last 60 to 70,000 years. And of course, what that has done is it, it, it has muddied the water between the climate change requirements and the vegan carnivore argument. Um, and so we're, we're, we're now seeing um, meat in particular, red meat in particular, but meat and dairy products being vilified as being the cause of climate change when in fact the truth is, is, is a long way from that, as you, as you know. And when, when this report came out, one of, their, one of their staunches, there has been lots of critics, myself was one of them, but uh, uh, one of the most staunchest critics was Professor Frank Mittler from UC Davis, where he challenged them on their greenhouse gas uh, assumptions and challenged them continually, in Twitter actually, Harry, um, <laughs> Was, is, is a large part of his media outlet, and um, and uh, he he received this um, response from the EAT Commission, from the Sci scientific director of the EAT Lancet, that meat consumption limits proposed by the commission were not set due to environmental considerations, but were solely in, solely in light of health recommendations. The dietary guidelines only refer to healthy eating. Thus, it is not the diet to reduce climate change, but the diet to reduce premature mortality due to dietary-related health causes. His, their last statement I take issue with as well as a nutritional physiologist, but I'll, I'll come back to that another day. But the, 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 this is a classic example of a lie being halfway around the world before the truth has even got its boots on. And so this is out there, this is being pushed continually that this is the diet to save the planet from ourselves. We've also got the other social side of it. So if we come up with solutions, and, and let's face it, from a food production point of view, one of the very likely solutions will be genetic technologies that in many parts of the world we're not allowed to use 
or even where we are to you allowed to use them, the public have um, have issue and wanted labelled to be able to make their own decisions. Um, obviously, we've got our, our situations here in New Zealand where um, the EPA regulates this, and up till now we have not had any GMO crops planted for commercial release in New Zealand. So these are the social challenges we're going to face. If we look at the mitigation and ad adaptation challenges very quickly, um, so the challenge of mitigation, look, this is a graph, and again, as a nutritionist, this is one I, I, really, um, I really appreciate. This was published by Marius Klaus in, um, in Animal back in 2010. And what you see in the graph is the fecal particle size. I know us nutritionists really like to get down and dirty. Um, is a fecal particle size from different herbivores uh, species. The black circles on the bottom right hand of the graph are the ruminants. So if you took those away for a second, what you see is that herbivores and pr primarily foregut, foregut fermenters, as they increase in size, the particle size of their feces increase, which means they're getting less and less nutrients from the forages that they're eating. However, the ruminants, a cow, is every bit as efficient as ex at extracting cellulose and the nutrients contained within the cells of the, of the plant as a rabbit is 25 to, uh, 1 25th of its size. So we're trying to reverse 60 million years of evolution, which has its challenges, as you can appreciate. And, uh, but we're making progress, I believe. I mean, there's been fantastic work done in sheep by ag research in terms of uh, breeding for lower methane animals. We're a little bit behind in cattle, but that's, that's getting going now as well. Um, there's, and I'm sh again, I'm sure it will be updated later in the, in the two days on, on other technologies to reduce methane. Um, one of those um, is our inhibitors, and this was a paper published by Alex Tristoff and a, co uh, a football team of co-authors um, on, on a very, what, what looks like a very good prospect, the graph on the right-hand side showing a 50%, uh, sorry, a 30% reduction in methane emissions. But, again, a wicked problem. How do we ensure that that requires the cows to consume that inhibitor all day, the cows, the sheep, the cattle. Um, in our system, that leaves us with a, a significant problem. And of course, we've got to ask ourselves the social question, will they be accepted by consumers? We can reduce production. So this, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to spend long on this. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. This was a paper we published in Journal of Dairy Science a couple of years ago, which basically showed that the intensification of the dairy industry had not resulted in an increased uh, profitability for the farmers that had actually intensified. But what it had done, of course, was it massively increased their carbon footprint. So what we're looking at is an increase in stock rate of about a cow to the hectare, uh, 1.3 or 1.1 tons of maize grain or maize silage brought in to feed those animals, and as a result, their carbon footprint increased by somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. So there is an opportunity, but it seems like a retrograde step to an awful lot of people, so it's not popular. Um, and if you think I'm nuts that that couldn't be the case, that somehow, you know, I, I, I drank the funny water this morning, um, this analysis out of uh, Lincoln University of the National Database over three years shows exactly the same thing. In fact, it shows a declining return on assets as we've intensified within the dairy industry. So there is an opportunity to actually reduce our carbon footprint and possibly not have a negative effect on, on the profitability of our industry. We can plant a billion trees, but again, a wicked problem. Where do we plant them? We need to be very, very careful where we plant a billion trees, what trees we plant and where we plant them. And then, where do we plant them? This is an ethical question because a lot of the rhetoric about where these trees will be planted is traditional sheep and beef countryside. Those stations are the lifeblood of communities. If we were to take those stations away and put trees there, that lifeblood is drawn away. So this is not a simple solution to a complex problem. It is certainly part of our solution, but it's one that we need to consider closely. And then, of course, last week, we had the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment basically um, state that uh, trees should only be used as an, to offset, uh, sorry, um, pine trees should only be used to offset methane, indigenous trees to uh, offset uh, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide shouldn't be given a free ride. So it's not simple. So just to summarize, thanks, Harry, um, it's a wicked problem with political, social, ethical, and scientific challenges. New Zealand's a small global emitter, and we need the big boys and girls to play the game if we're truly going to have the effect that we want in the world. 
Our greenhouse gas profile is unique agriculture at approximately 50% of our emissions, but approximately 50% of those emissions um, is, is short-lived gases and have a very different effect on our long-term climate to what fossil fuel-derived carbon dioxide will. And New Zealand feeds approximately 10 times its population. Again, the ethical question, should we reduce that or are we better to do it here because we do it better? Uh, there's no silver bullet mitigation, and uh, look, I would argue that the public need education and not just information. And I think that's someplace where we've probably failed miserably, and I'm delighted to see so many people here because that's what I'm going to challenge you to do. When you go away today, when you're at your dinner parties on Saturday night, make sure you're providing these people with education and not just information. Thank you, Harry.